afternoon. This is the stalwart few. You have hung out through the entire conference and you still want more. I'm very proud of you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Uh, so John Rose is not just the uh, global CTO for EMC Dell. He's also uh, an old friend of mine and one of the key people who convinced me to take the job running the Cloud Foundry Foundation. I think it might be becoming something of a tradition, but towards the end of the year, we end up doing these fireside chats in public, and uh, sometimes I get part of my annual review. So pay close attention, and something funny might drop. We'll see. Uh, so John, exciting times for you. Uh, the, the Dell Technologies merger has just completed. I know your hair was full of that. You're operating Dell EMC. You're still working with VMware and Pivotal and all the other, other assets. But I want to take your, take your brain out of that for a minute and, and put I, you solidly in Cloud Foundry. I, I totally appreciate that. The last uh, 10 months putting together an $80 billion company, uh, it's nice to be here uh, not doing integration and uh, sorting out uh, uh, where things land and how to build the company. But uh, good news is we're through, the, through that. We're now a real company, Dell Technologies, uh, uh, onward and upward. So thanks for the vacation. Awesome. So. Uh, so we were, we were catching up earlier about the patterns that we're starting to see in the, in the industry and the, this, this big trend towards application modernization, where there's a kind of a lens of what's Cloud Foundry for. A while ago, people thought, oh, this is only for greenfield applications. Yep. Now we're starting to see that it, it's affecting the structure of application workloads and data that's been sitting resident in enterprises for years. So I thought uh, we'd, all, we'd all benefit from getting some of your thoughts on on what's happening in, in app modernization as a pattern yeah. with Cloud Foundry. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, um, when we formed the uh, Cloud Foundry Foundation, what, two, two years ago, I guess it was? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think formally, formally people signed the agreements in August of 14. Yeah, so. Uh, you gave me my job January 21st of 2015. There we go, okay. So, so, so two years, you know, you, you, you rewind back two years ago, if any of you were, by the way, who was, who was involved in Cloud Foundry two years ago? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. Um, it, two, two years ago, uh, most of us kind of looked at this platform and thought that what we were really about was building the next kind of newly composed, innovative, disruptive application, which, by the way, hopefully we're still doing a lot of that. Um, last year, when we got together, we started to see patterns where not only were the bleeding edge using these technologies, but we were seeing very strong patterns in large enterprises and service providers that had actually gotten beyond just testing and it started to put it into practice and were using it as the underpinnings of a, a next generation infrastructure, if you will. Um, over the last year, two things have happened that I think are pretty exciting. The, the first is we're seeing Cloud Foundry specifically start to become a, a foundation under let's call it modernization of an entire legacy ecosystem or many legacy ecosystems. And the big ones for me are um, the, we're starting to see the real-time communication world uh, become a consumer of cloud native. Now, that seems strange because most of us are familiar with 12-factor apps and stateless, and we don't really think about real-time communication in that concept. But if you look at what things like Cisco is doing with Spark, yeah. Clearly, we see you know, the adoption, and this platform works well in that environment. At yeah, Spark, Spark's been a breakout performance for them. WebEx Absolutely. is part of, that, uh, part of that, and they've actually contributed a lot of ideas towards Cloud Foundry as a result. Uh, absolutely, and it's putting pressure on the system to basically say, hey, this is, this is for more than just that next generation modern stateless app. It's actually for new applications and existing customers, and now applications across entire ecosystems. Even the document management world, one of these stodgy old worlds, we, had a, we have a business called Documentum that we're, we're now selling off to open text, and we got a pretty good price for it. It's a great business, and one of the reasons why it's valuable, even though Documentum's been around for a long time, is about three years ago, we began a journey to completely re-architect the document management ecosystem by using Cloud Foundry as the basis underneath it. So things as you know, relatively state as storing and managing documents inside of a large-scale enterprise are now being delivered across Cloud Foundry-type foundations. And it's not just happening in single instances, it's entire industries. So real-time, industrial, document management, these things that we really didn't contemplate two years ago as the mainstream use of this technology are now becoming mainstream uses of it. So it's pretty exciting to see the evolution. I think it's putting pressure on the development community because every time we bring one of these new ecosystems to bear, suddenly there's a new set of requirements. Suddenly we need uh, runtime persistence. We need the ability to handle real-time data streams. We need new protocol support. All of this stuff you know, is goodness, by the way, because it keeps us all busy, um, but it's also an indication of adoption of the technology, not as a component within an isolated stack, but as a foundational technology in a very large, broad, diverse set of ecosystems. Well, the, the great thing about the Documentum case was that it was 
it pra pragmatically broke a bunch of sacred, you know, a, a bunch of previously sacred rules. So anybody who was involved in Cloud Foundry two years ago knows uh, push code only, never talk about containers. It's like Fight Club, don't, don't talk about containers. And for sure, nothing special about containers, no float, snowflakes, no, no persistence. So you couldn't attach a volume to a container inside Cloud Foundry. But in order to take Documentum, which is a, a pretty epic ISV, right, with, with like, I mean, I don't even know how many petabytes of, of information under management globally and different customers for Documentum, in order for them to move forward, they had to have access to the volumes that they managed. Yeah. So EMC and IBM collaborated on the persistence project, affectionately codenamed Percy. Uh, that's, now, that's included in Diego, which Chip Childers talked about yesterday. It's the, the latest and greatest uh, industrial strength scheduler. So these things are, are pushing us forward in a really, it's a, in a beautifully pragmatic way. We still support the code model, and that's always gonna be important, but we have to support ISVs if we're gonna build the right future for Cloud Foundry as a platform. The test is, can you have certified packaged applications that people just buy? They might even not know Cloud Foundry's inside. And that was, that was part of the open text interest, right? The, the transformation of the yeah. Documentum business yeah, from I think, I, I think on-premises to SaaS. You know, three, three or four years ago, the dialogue might have been about you know, consolidating an industry. What they're actually picking up is an extraordinarily modern, agile platform and architecture to go forward. And you know, sometimes changing your platform to make it modern actually has unintended consequences that are quite good. Uh, you know, we didn't predict an open text acquisition uh, moving that piece of technology over there, but I think it definitely helped. You, know, you can ask their opinion, but I think they'll be pretty positive on the overall effort. Yeah, and we, we see, you know, in, in, in a way, we see SAP is going through a massive modernization process, talk about an ex existing ex estate, and then HANA Cloud Platform is a way to be able to get back into all of, all of that uh, existing data and value and, and, and bring it forward. One of the things you mentioned, though, is it puts stress on the development community, but I want to flip from, we usually talk about the development community as being the contributors and committers to Cloud Foundry itself. But I want to flip that around and look at the global developer audience. One of the things that we keep hearing about Cloud Foundry is this is amazing technology. Where do I find the developers who can build on it? Because now I've done my pilot. I've got 12 developers who can build on it. I actually need 1,000. Where do I go find 1,000 developers? So it's something that we've been talking a lot about on the board yeah. as a sort of what do we do to enable the, the Cloud Foundry economy. Yeah, so, so maybe the first part of your performance review, you know, uh, good job on the first piece. We have a nice platform. Um, a lot more work to do on the second piece. Uh, you know, we have, we have a growing community of literate people who can develop cloud-native applications, understand these platforms, and can even, in many cases, do contributions to them, but we are nowhere near where we need to be. Um, the, you know, here's a statistic. In the United States, for instance, there's roughly two million software developers employed in the United States. That number 20 years ago was roughly two million software developers. Um, it hasn't really grown dramatically. Now that's great if you're a software developer because you're highly employable, um, but what it means is that we, we have a, a somewhat captive, fixed set of, of people who, for the last decade, when software wasn't eating the world, maybe we're doing less interesting things. As we go into this next decade where original software development is absolutely critical to every enterprise in the world. You, you will not be competitive in your market if you cannot originally create IPR and technology in the software world to transform your industry. And so we have to help, quite frankly, create either a bigger pool which I think is gonna be difficult, to be perfectly honest. I think you know, we should definitely be investing in, in training and education and trying to bring more people into the software developing world, but over the last 20 years, we've been saying that, and it hasn't really changed much. So we have to look at two things. One, reskilling, um, giving people an opportunity to play with this technology, to experiment with it in a friendly environment, and that requires, you know, I mean, we have the dojo model, which is one approach, but there's many other models that we have to pursue because, you know, most software developers are intellectually curious about new technology, but busy. And so giving them an easy way to experiment and learn and, and, and quite frankly, figure out how to use the technology on their own terms is useful. Um, the, the second, though, is that we have to look at efficiency. You know, some of the, the wish lists that came up in the presentations talked about the fact that, you know, we really want the system to understand that we have a finite amount of time to develop our application and deliver it. And even though we're using some of the most modern and development tools and methodologies in the world in most of the Cloud Foundry deployments, um, we still have to do better. We have to basically look for friction anywhere. We have to make uh, it much simpler to test the behavior of the system when you're developing an application. We have to just ask ourselves, any cycle that a software developer is spending yeah. doing something that isn't about the creation of something useful 
is something we need to automate in the platform. We need to move down into the stack and take it away from them. I think we're, we're the gold standard today, I think, uh, but we're not where we need to be because we have this problem of a finite amount of software development capability and an infinite amount of work that we have to do across our industries. Um, that, that, you know, but Sam, that's your, your, next, your next adventure is uh, we got to go solve this problem. 2017 performance yeah. review will be based any, on Any that. ideas what you're going to commit to? Uh, yeah, there's a couple comments you made that, uh, that, that remind me of a few things in the past. So uh, I once saw the Olympic sprinter Michael Johnson speak, um, and he held the fastest man in the world record, I think, for 10 years running. So once he set the first world record, he had kind of a challenge. How does he set the second and the third? So I think we are the gold standard for usability, but that is not enough. You can't stand still. You have to compete with yourself. One of the things I'd like to see this community do is to be as forward and forthright as Rakuten was to say, dear Santa, here are the things that are kind of not as wonderful as, like, as I'd like them to be, or the things that are actually totally broken and making me miserable, because then we can start to fix those. A great example of that is Cloud Foundry is frequently deployed on top of OpenStack. OpenStacks are all quite different, but Marco Volz uh, from SAP and a team of engineers working on Cloud Foundry built an automatic OpenStack validator. An automatic OpenStack validator is fantastic. A lot of friction to take away. You can say, am I Cloud Foundry ready? How weird is my OpenStack configuration? What do I need to do to, to, to remedy it? That's an example of the kind of friction we can, we can solve. I really like the term that you used, reskilling. Like one of the things that we try to make an emphasis on in the Cloud Foundry community is human centricity and empathy. So if you think about a typical modern enterprise, anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 engineers, they're fully employed building and maintaining legacy systems. They've got very good skills building on web logic and web sphere or mainframes, right? Or whatever, some range of technologies. They're not bad people. They're not dumb people. They're not lazy people. They want to be as relevant as anybody else. And we've just seen from Brexit and we're seeing from American politics what happens when you announce the great transformation and you leave a whole bunch of people behind. So we have an enormous responsibility to reskill engineers to help them come through and build cloud native apps. Yeah. We've done a couple things this year, so I'm, we're, we're far from solved. We've open sourced a bunch of training, things that we used to get charged for from many of our uh, member companies, including Pivotal. That's, for, that's available for free. It's not enough. We need to follow that up with certification. And it's going to take the industry to help us. We think there's a great opportunity in selling training and bringing that along with consulting services and aligning that to certification so we can create you know, modest goal. Let's, yeah. let's go create a couple hundred thousand certified Cloud Foundry developers over the next few years. Yeah. That's probably going to get us a lot closer to meeting the kind of global demand that we see. Yeah. Last thought on this, Liam Maxwell was here, the CTO of the UK. One of his top issues was we need to massively reskill the United Kingdom in order to participate in the digital economy. So these aren't just corporate issues. These are actually national level issues that we can start to serve. Yeah, by, by the way, you know, as the, you know, putting my chairman of the Cloud Foundry Foundation hat on, you know, one, one thing to think about, any of you who are, you know, entrepreneurs who are thinking about your next great adventure, you know, um, generally if you did software development, you're thinking about building the next software product. What we've discovered is in the first rain round of, let's call it consolidations around Cloud Foundry, where the big players started to absorb some of the ecosystem, um, we, we, we definitely uh, accumulated a lot of great technology and a lot of great people into these ecosystems. But the one thing we lost is we lost the scale of independent organizations that can actually help a company independent of the distribution, independent of the vendor they're using, uh, move forward. And I think there's still some of that, and obviously the primary vendors do it in many cases, but there is a, a, a bit of a, a, a void right now where you know, we really want to encourage people to think about the fact that their participation in the ecosystem as an entrepreneur might not be about building a widget. It might be about intellectual capacity to help other people build their widgets. And we actually think there's almost an untapped demand for that. Uh, you know, we've seen, you know, I can just speak for ourselves in the Dell Technologies ecosystem, you know, Pivotal Labs is oversubscribed, you know, full stop. Um, we have a lot of activity going on. We, we can't keep up, to be perfectly honest. Um, but there are other dimensions that we don't even address that that service side, that independent expertise is actually going to be highly valuable for a fairly long time as we move through this transition. So, you know, the shameless ask uh, for the ecosystem in the industry is, you know, the smart people in this room who are thinking about doing something new don't necessarily buy us exclusively towards building a piece of code or a technology. There might actually be a much higher value proposition. It might have a bigger impact actually building a, more of a services function that can actually help other people develop their technologies and their in enterprises. I think you heard that from any any customer that stood up here said their biggest challenge was they got started 
and then they, they usually chose some technology suppliers, and then they tried to find expertise. A lot of it was to hire them, but in many cases, they will just leverage those expertise, so there's definitely demand out there. And we definitely feel like that. And I don't think it's a weak link, because I think we have sufficient uh, scale, but it's a huge opportunity for people to participate. If the market's as big as we believe it's growing, and as you watch the announcements from the, the, the major vendors of Cloud Foundry, they, they are bringing a lot of marketing to the table, so there's a lot of awareness of it. So just to offer a few names of recently uh, you know, created companies, um, you've got Resilient Scale, you've got Engineer Better, you've got Armacuni, you've got our stalwarts like Stark and Wayne and Altoros. They're all building good businesses. We want them to be incredible businesses, and we think there are room for dozens more. So let us help you. Let us know what you need, and let us tell you a little bit about the assets that we're trying to bring to bear to, to help you build a business and to support global, uh, the global demand for Cloud Foundry expertise. So it kind of brings me to where the expertise is, is, is being driven some of the demands are coming from, there's been a lot of successful product launches on Cloud Foundry yeah. this year. Yeah. Right? You know particularly a lot of the ones in networking and telecommunications. Right. They're kind of surprising, so if you can walk us through a few. Well, well I, mean, I, I mean, the big one for us was, was obviously launching Leap in the document on the enterprise content division. I mean, that was, that was a huge uh, you know, update. You know, what, what, what's interesting is it didn't just replatform the system. It allowed us to completely revector towards being able to feel comfortable that we could enter vertical markets extremely quickly. You know, one of the reasons why most companies don't go vertical is that, you know, if you have to build it from scratch and it's operating as a silo and all the infrastructure is independent, if that vertical doesn't work out, you may have a problem. But if you're building it on a cloud native environment and you're actually able to, quite frankly, compose your solution for that vertical, and most of it is reusable and most of it is very flexible, your ability to go explore new verticals and to move very quickly into them and potentially scale them up and down as businesses because the technology scales up and down and is leverageable becomes you know, much more probable. And so Leap was, that's a, a big deal. Obviously I mentioned you know, the culmination of that is yep. the combination of our enterprise content division and open text and we're really excited about that. We think that's going to be a great uh, you know, powerhouse in the content development uh, or content uh, management ecosystem. Um, obviously, Cisco continues to do great work around you know, their, their collaboration, unified communications, uh, and, and other services. Uh, the Spark launch, I think, was just, you know, they've gotten great traction here. Yeah. Um, it's interesting how few people realize how modern the underlying infrastructure is on those systems. It's nothing against Cisco. I think they're doing fantastic work, but they're not really viewed as a software company in many cases. And when people start to realize that they're using the most modern of modern and they're actually leading the adoption of these technologies in real-time communication, it actually creates a very, very positive perception of that company and, and their leadership in the, in the collaboration space. Yeah, I think the establishment of Cloud Foundry as the standard yeah. has really contributed to that. You mentioned that um, Industrials are typically very slow to move, but then look at what we've seen this week. Siemens Mindsphere, uh, GE predicts launched this year, both doing extremely well. We see a movement within heavy industry yeah. towards what we might think is brand new, but they perceive it as a standard solving this fairly interesting problem. Well, if any of you have ever dealt with uh, industrial companies, and I, I love my industrial customers, uh, um, they aren't the fastest moving because industrial is big, heavy, you know, complex environments. And I, I've been dealing with, uh, you know, SCADA infrastructure and, you know, technologies like Modbus and Mod TCP and these underlying technologies that are, anybody who's developed a modern protocol would be scratching their head about these things, but they, they have to last 20, 30 years in place. They have to run in power grids. Uh, and, and the slowness in which those industries typically had moved was, was staggering. I mean, you know, I think 15 years ago, I was helping two of the big industrial companies kind of modernize their view of, of networking. And I remember having this discussion with literally two, one big Japanese, one big US, like major companies. And I was introducing to them this, this concept called Wi-Fi. Now, Wi-Fi had been in the, in the home for five years by then. And they looked at it and said, seems way out there. That's really complex. I don't know if I want to deal with this. It's not really proven. I mean, this is you know, mainstream everywhere. Every mobile device, every home had this technology. Internet and, over the air, science fiction. Well, and it was, it was just there's a natural conservatism in that industry because they're building infrastructure that, you know, runs countries and the world. I mean, it's a, it, you know, it has a very, very long duration. I am 
really, you know, given that context, I am just amazed and excited about the shift because it's the industrial companies yeah. that are actually the biggest early adopters in some cases of technologies like Cloud Foundry. And it's good for two reasons. One, I think they're going to get huge value both to themselves and to the world because if we modernize our infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, that has huge implications on quality of life and, and, and you know, geopolitical ramifications in a positive way. The other is, Talk about an endorsement of a technology when the people who are arguably the most conservative and long-term thinkers in all industries are jumping head first into this and more importantly, being successful, making the technology work and, and demonstrating significant value to their customers and their businesses by using this technology. So that one is, a, is an odd one, yeah. but very exciting. Yeah, and, and poised for new opportunities. So QIO is a startup that launched this year also on Cloud Foundry, and they build you know heavy industry solutions for private clouds. They'll put it in the converged device, put it on a ship, yeah. you know, put it in a factory. So amazing stuff. We're uh, we're out of time, but I wanted to get any last thoughts you have on on 2017. Both my performance review, of course, I'm personally interested, yeah. and uh, you know other things that you want the community well, to think about as we have them assembled. Well, so so performance review, you know, Sam, uh, you know, I think we've all said it. You know, we're thrilled that you're in this role. I mean, you know, you're, you're a friend. We've worked together a long time. Different boards, different engagements. You know, the, the, this this ecosystem only works if we have a community. And you know, I think uh, the foundation's purpose is to be the center of that community, but not to be the community. Its job is to facilitate. Um, you know, I, I look at the adoption of the technology as the gold, as the thing that we really want to measure, and that's just been spectacular. Um, I look at the involvement uh, from the, the end users, the developer community, the industry. You know, this is uh, arguably, with maybe the exception of kind of Linux, probably the largest you know adopted open source initiative going on in the world right now. I mean, we're seeing you know upwards of half of the cloud native applications at scale being deployed on Cloud Foundry now, which is a you know, pretty exciting thing. Uh, no pressure, but uh, <laughs> uh, but 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 given the fact that you you know we're now two years into this and we started from you know a decent starting point, but 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 a beginning. Uh, last year was a great year. I think this year was an exceptional year. You've done a fantastic job. Um, the year in front of us, um, we have to make sure we don't screw it up. So uh, I'll okay. try not to screw it so, up. But good job. So anyway, awesome. okay. please right. thank Thanks. John Rose. John, thank you so much. Thanks.